and uh, as well as go back and talk a little bit about uh, a couple of ideas you may have talked about in Cal 3, if you've seen Cal 3. So, so that is my goal for today is to get the rest of chapter 3 done. So um, like I mentioned last time, I kind of just put all of 3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3 together and uh, mix them all together. So we talked about a couple of different ways that we could evaluate determinants through row reduction and through cofactor expansion. And we talked about properties and determinants along the way as well. So you could have seen all of those things <clears throat> in the homework assignment. Uh, like I mentioned before as well, I split across the uh, web assigned. So your web assigned for 3 2 will be due on tomorrow, and your 3 3 will be due on Thursday. All right, in any event, as I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about. That idea that we mentioned in class, let's see if I can find a decent example in here. Maybe, maybe. I have to make one up. Oh, wait, I do have a handout. Did I give a handout last time, didn't I? Now, where did I put that handout? Better question. Oh, is it in the book? Take it out of the book. There it is. Eventually, I'll get to it. Anybody need one of the handouts I handed out last time? Yeah. All right. Where I'm looking is down at the bottom of the page there. Where it has, has that number 14 has those different looking systems that we're trying to solve. So let's take this from a slightly different tack. The idea behind this is if we look at a matrix equation that we're trying to solve, let's say you were trying to solve the equation, and just generally speaking, maybe you were being asked to solve the equation ax equals lambda x. Now let's first talk about why we might be interested in solving such an equation. What type of multiplication are you doing on the left-hand side? It's matrix multiplication, right? Think of the matrix A times the vector X, or the matrix A times the matrix X, if you want to think of X as a matrix. But what type of uh, computation are you doing on the right-hand side? What kind of multiplication is happening on the right-hand side? <laughs> it's scalar, isn't it? Right? Which is easier to do, matrix multiplication or scalar multiplication? Scalar, right? It requires fewer multiplications. So what we're, when we talk about trying to do this type of solution, we're really trying to talk about replacing matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication. From a computational standpoint, that's easier to do. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So we're trying to figure out for what vectors will this work. That's essentially what we're trying to solve. That's the idea behind this. It's not quite written in that number 14 in that way, but we'll talk about going back to that number 14 here in a second. But let's just talk about what would have to happen. Well, if you were just doing this back in high school, pre-algebra class, if you want to solve this for x, what would you do? So I've got an X on both sides. So what would you do? Yeah, I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably move over with everything to one side and get all my X's together, right? I wouldn't want to divide by X because that's the thing I'm trying to solve for. And it's possible it could be zero, right? So, but move everything over to one side. It would leave me with the, zero, the vector with zeros in it. It would have a column matrix with zeros in it. We'll refer to that right now as a zero vector. It's still a zero matrix, it just happens to be a column, so I can think of it as a vector. Moving this over to the other side, I'd like to be able to factor this x out, right? The problem is, that's a matrix and that is a scalar, right? So what I mean by that, don't write this down, but what I mean by that is, does this, make any sense? No. 
from a computational standpoint, that makes no sense because I'm trying to subtract two different types of objects, right? So I need to do something first that doesn't change this. I need to do something first before I can factor it out. What might I could put right here in between the scalar and the vector that doesn't change the multiplication at all, but allows me to factor off the X and make a well-defined matrix operation? What thing do you might think I might want to stick in there? The identity matrix, right? Take the same size identity matrix as we have for A, by the way, we're doing all this stuff, A better be square, okay? But I can put the identity matrix in here first. I'm putting it in next to the X. I could technically put parentheses around it, but we know from all the properties we've talked about before that it doesn't matter if I do the I times the X first and then multiply by the scalar, or do the scalar times the I and then multiply by the matrix, the X vector X. Those are the same, so I don't need to worry about parentheses. But now I've got two matrices, A and lambda I, that have the same size, so I'm able to factor out the X. <clears throat> So in trying to replace matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication, we've changed the system into what type of system? Looking at the last line, what type of system do we have now? I got a zero on the right hand side. What kind of system do we have? Homogeneous system, right? Do you agree? It's a homogeneous system since we have the system of equations here with a zero on the right hand side, so we have a homogeneous system. What's always a solution to any homogeneous system? The zero vector, right? We always know that that certainly is a solution, but if that's the only solution, that makes this very, very uninteresting, right? We want to try to replace matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication in some non trivial way. I don't want to replace scalar multiplication, or excuse me, matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication. Just with zero all the time. That's not interesting, right? I want to try to do it in a non-trivial way. How do I know when a homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions when I have a square matrix? How do I know that the homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions? Or maybe let's, put, let's say it another way. I know it only has a trivial solution when what is true about the matrix? It's invertible, right? All right. If, if I can take the inverse on both sides, then I just get x equals zero, right? So if I want this to have non-trivial solutions, what better be true about this matrix? It better what, not have an inverse, right? It better be singular, right? If I want non-trivial solutions, I better have a singular matrix. And what numeric way, you know, what numeric check do we have now to show that this matrix is singular? The yeah, determinant is equal to zero, right? So this will have non-trivial solutions. And those are the ones that we're interested in. This will have non-trivial solutions when the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to zero. Notice what the effect is that subtracting lambda i has on a. What does lambda what does lambda times i look like? What kind of matrix does that look like? Yeah, lambda down the diagonal, right? The diagonal matrix with lambda down the diagonal. So if I subtract, what does what effect does this have on a? What does A look like after I subtract lambda I? It's whatever its value minus lambda. Yeah, exactly. It looks exactly like A, except down the diagonal we've subtracted lambda, right? It looks exactly the same, except that we've subtracted the lambda off the diagonal. What this will give us then is a polynomial in lambda of degree whatever, how many rows or columns we have, a degree n, if we say that A is n by n. We'll see it from a 
an exact uh, an example here. All right. Anyway, so what we're saying here is that I now have an equation to solve, and I know how to do it relatively quickly. I'll subtract lambda off my diagonal, take the determinant, set it equal to zero, and solve. That's the idea. This, and this is stuff we're going to come back to in a later chapter as well, but just to give you some terminology. This is called the characteristic equation of A. So let's see if I can do this by a specific example. I think we look, looked at number uh, letter A last time for number 14. Pardon me. So let's look at B on that handout. So it has give you the system 2x1 plus 3x2 equals lambda x1 and 4x1 plus 3x2 equals lambda x2. It's written out kind of longhand, if you will. It's not written as a matrix equation. But I do see matrix times x1, x2 equals lambda times x1, x2, right? So in this case, your matrix A is what? What is the matrix A in this case? Well, just, just the A. We'll do the minus lambda in a second. You're right. What is it going to be? What's A? We'll worry about the lambda in a second. What's the A matrix? I'm just asking for the coefficients. Yeah, that one. Two, three, four, three. Okay. That's the A matrix, right? It's just the coefficients on the X1, the X2. All right, so now let's do, we want determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. That's the matrix we're going to solve. So now the left-hand side, I want the determinant of what matrix? What's that one look like? Good. Yeah. We have the two minus lambda three and then four and three minus lambda down. Again, this has the effect of just subtracting lambda down your diagonal. We have a two by two matrix here. How do we do a determinant of a two by two? Yeah, good. We multiply down the main diagonal, subtract what we get when we multiply the off diagonal. Two minus lambda times three minus lambda minus 12 equals zero. And you can see that, hopefully, you can see that you should be getting a degree two polynomial here when you multiply it out. We have a two by two matrix, so we should be getting a two a degree two polynomial when we're done. By the way, the if you ignore the not e, the if you ignore the right hand side of this equation and just look at the polynomial you're creating, it's also called the characteristic polynomial. All right, so now we solve. We need to multiply this out and hopefully refactor. At the very least, we'll need to use quadratic formula on this one. Lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 6. So we can we'll multiply that out. Oops. Simplify your constants. You get lambda squared minus 5 lambda minus 6. That is nicer than the example we did at the end of class last time because that actually factors. So we get lambda minus six times lambda plus one equals zero. So we get six and negative one for our answers here. So these are the values of lambda for which our original system now has non-trivial solutions. So notice that I said that if we're going to replace 
Uh, I'm sorry. We, I said that the goal of doing this is to replace matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication. But we have to do that in the special cases now where the scalar is 6 or the scalar is negative 1. Okay? So we'll have special cases that we can do that. We'll have special vectors that we can do that with. Hopefully, later on, we'll talk about how we could possibly do this for any single vector that we came across that we want to multiply A by. That's our goal for a later chapter. Right now, we just want to find these values for where non-trivial uh, solutions exist and then find the corresponding solutions for this. Okay, that's our goal. All right. These values have a special name as well. These are called the eigenvalues of A. Sometimes they're also called the characteristic values. So we had to throw a little bit of German in there. <clears throat> All right, any questions on how we found the eigenvalues? We did this for a two by two, but you can do it for any square matrix that you want. Same process. All right. So the last step of this, and like I said, we'll expand on this later. Right now we're just getting the idea down. The last step of this would be to find the X's that we can actually replace matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication. Okay. So we have two scenarios. We've got one where lambda is equal to 6, the other where lambda is equal to negative 1. So go back up to your matrix. This is where we subtracted the lambda off the diagonal here, right? I want to solve the system. 4, 3, sorry, negative 4, 3, and 4, 3, for negative 3, if I could write. Equal uh, is uh, equal to zero. Right again. Here's my original matrix. I'm just plugging in six for the lambda. This is where the six is coming in, subtracted off the diagonal. Remember, this is after we've subtracted the lambda i to the other side. So we have a homogeneous system that I'm trying to solve. That's why I put the zero zero here for the augmented part. Okay. This row reduction is pretty easy, right? If I add row 1 to row 2, row 2 goes away. So if you put this in a reduced row echelon form, you should get 1, negative 3, 4, 0, and 0, 0, 0 here. I can add row 1 to row 2, make row 2 go away, and then divide through by negative 4. Every, by the way, if you've done this correctly, if you found your eigenvalues correctly, you should always get infinitely many solutions. If you don't, you've calculated your eigenvalues wrong. Okay? You should always get at least one row of zeros when you do this row reduction. So now notice that here is your free variable, right? So your solutions, bless you would be some scalar times three-fourths one, right? This could be anything. This is the, if this is T, if your X2 is T, then your X1 would be three-fourths T, right? We've solved those before. If you want to be fancy and get rid of your fractions, I could, T can be absolutely anything, right? Any real number. So I could just write this as t times 3, 4. So any multiple of 3, 4 would work as a solution. I know I did that quick, but we've done solutions, right? This is not new. Right? Okay. Again, what we're saying here is that any vector in this form, if I take the matrix that we started with times this vector, I should get 6 times this vector. That's the whole point of this. Our original matrix was what? 2, 3, 4, 3. That was the original matrix. Multiply by 3, 4. I get 6 plus 12. I get 18 up here. Right? 12 plus 12. I get 24 here, which is 6 times 3, 4. Oh, that shot up. Sorry about that. 
Yes. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Any any scalar multiple of it will work. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you use. I just got rid of the fraction. But again, here's this is the whole point of this. For this particular matrix and this particular vector, well, any scalar multiple of this vector, I can replace the matrix multiplication with the scalar multiplication. Okay. And again, this is easier to do. It also allows you to look at long, the whole point of this, at least part of the whole point of this, is that you can do some analysis on long-term behavior of things that are happening. It's a lot easier to calculate a limit if you're looking at limits of constants doing something over time than it is for matrices going, doing something over time. Let's do the other one. If lambda is equal to negative 1, again, I want to go back up to that original matrix and plug in negative 1 for lambda. What matrix do you get when you do that? When you put negative 1 in for the lambda? You get 3, 3, 4, 4. And again, hopefully it's pretty easy to see that this is going to have a row of zeros when we row reduce, right? If I do negative four thirds times the first row and add it to the second, the second row is going to go away, isn't it? The reduced row echelon form here will be one, one, zero, 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 zero. So what do your solutions look like here? Again? Yeah, either way it works. Usually we think about this being the one and that being the negative one, but one negative one works too. They just have to be the opposite of each other. In fact, any matrix, or excuse me, any vector that has the uh, components being the opposite of each other will work. So this is any scalar multiple. And again, we can check that this really is an I, uh, this really is satisfying that property. If I take the original matrix times negative 1, 1, what should I end up, by the way, what should I end up with? If it's supposed to replace matrix multiplication with scalar multiplication, what vector should I end up with when I do this without actually doing the work? Yeah, negative 1 times the vector. So it should be, instead of being negative 1, 1, it should be 1, negative 1, we're done, right? We should get the opposite of the vector. That's the whole point of this. Do we? What do we get when we multiply this together? Yeah. We do get negative one times that. If you've done it correctly, that should be what you get. The whole point of doing this. What questions do you have? By the way, this last part is just me checking to make sure that we really did find what we said we found, right? This last part is just really checking that I really do have a solution. So we had the eigenvalue of six. We found this was our general solution. I took one specific example and multiplied it by my matrix and said, hey, I really did get six times what I started with. And then did the same thing for negative one. By the way, these vectors that we're finding here, these solutions, this 3, 4 is called an eigenvector for the matrix associated with the eigenvalue of six. The negative of uh, the Negative 1, 1 is called an eigenvector associated with negative 1. So we have eigenvalues and eigenvectors. When we talk about everything that works for an eigenvector for a particular eigenvalue, you refer to that as an eigenspace for that eigenvalue. We're going to talk more about that later if you want to hear about that. All right, so again, what I'm worried about right now is can you find the eigenvalues and can you find corresponding eigenvectors as you go through this process? We'll talk more about their uses later. Right now, that's all we're doing. It's a nice application of determinants.
Any question on the process? Even if the concept right now is a little fuzzy, is the, pro is the process okay for what we did? It's the same process every single time. All right, let's do some other <clears throat> determinant ideas. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to define a new matrix that's referred to as the adjoint of a matrix. All right, rather than writing on a long-winded definition of what we mean by adjoint, we're just going to compute one. All right, so let's let our matrix A start out to be, let's say, 2, negative 1, 0, 5, 1, 1, 3, negative 4, negative 2. We already talked about finding minors and cofactors based on entries, right? What I mean by that is, say you were doing the determinant by expanding along the first row. One of the first things you did was you took this constant times the determinant of that submatrix, right? This submatrix, and then with the associated plus or minus part is what's referred to as the cofactor. Okay. So, notice that we have nine different cofactors, right? There's a cofactor for each entry that you could delete, right? Okay. So, let's just start computing some cofactors here. All right, so here's how you do your cofactors. Again, you this says I'm going to delete row one, column one, right? And compute the determinant of the submatrix that's left. So I deleted row one, column one. Bless you. And we end up with what, six when we do that? Two minus a minus four? Oh, it is negative two. So how about negative two minus, so this is positive two then, thank you. It would help if I knew what I was writing or what I had written, I should say. All right. The last thing you have to worry about with these, co well, these cofactors, you find them exactly the same way what we did with um, doing the cofactors that we were multiplying by to do our determinant expansion, right? This is nothing new. We're just not multiplying it by the coefficient. However, you do need to make sure you keep track of whether or not it's plus or minus, like we did with our determinants, right? Okay. This one's going to, we can do our sign board and it still works. Probably the easy way to do it is notice that if this adds up to an even number, one plus one is two, it'll be positive. If it adds up to an odd, it's a negative. Okay. The technical, I'm, I'm going to write it down. You have to remember it this way, but your technical cofactor definition is negative one to the I plus J times the determinant of the minor associated oops, with the ij term. m sub ij is that submatrix that we're forming by deleting row i and column j. Okay, that's how we're doing it. But again, we need to keep track of whether it's plus or minus. I can look at the subscripts, and if it's odd sum, it'll be negative. If it's an even sum, it'll be positive. All right. How about the 1, 2? First, will it be positive or negative? Negative, good. And then if I'm deleting row one and column two, what matrix do I have left? Column one, sorry, row one, column two. Five, one, three, negative two. Negative 10 minus three is negative 13, but it's minus, so it'll be a positive 13. Let's do the one, three. What is it? Good. 
will be positive or negative? Positive, good. Negative 20 minus 3 is negative 23. Only six more to go. <laughs> Next cofactor, will it be positive or negative? Ne it'll be negative, right? Because it's two plus one is three, right? Row two, column one, deleted. Good. Because right, yeah, we're doing... Here's row one, row two, column one goes away, right? Two minus zero is two, but it's negative. So you get negative. Oh, hey, that's an ugly looking two. You tell me what the next one is. C22. Two, two. Yeah, be positive, good. Uh, what would you say at the upper right? Zero. Good. Okay, I just didn't hear you. <laughs> yep, that's right. So we're deleting row two, column two. So we get net two, zero, net three, negative two. So we get negative four. Are we getting the idea of where these are coming from? It's not very exciting, but <laughs> what they are. All right. The two, three. Oh, we'll just go through the next ones quickly. The two, three part. It'll be, it's odd when I add them together, so it'll be negative. Row two, column three, we're left with two, negative one, three, negative four, negative eight, plus three is negative five, but it's negative, so I get five. We agree? Okay. Do three, one, it'll be positive. Negative one, zero, one, one. So I get negative one. Three, two will be negative. Two, zero, five, one. So we'll get negative two. Three, three will be positive. I'll get two, negative one, five, one. And I get seven. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Assuming I did all my arithmetic correctly and grabbed the values correctly. Now, one thing you may have noticed, or may not, but may have noticed, is I wrote these vertically when I started going across the rows, right? I went across row one, but wrote it vertically. I went across row two, but wrote it vertically. I went across row three, but wrote it vertically. There's a reason why I did that. When we Form the adjunct or the adjoint, sorry. The definition is it's the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. So since I know it's the transpose, that was why I was writing them in vertical columns. So now I can just write down what these entries are. 2, 13, negative 23 for the first column, negative 2, negative 4, 5 for the second column. And negative one, negative two, seven for the third column. Again, the definition for the adjoint is the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. Now, the reason why we want it to be the transpose of the matrix of cofactors is for a property that we want when we take the matrix times its adjoint. We created these cofactors using the submatrices by deleting this first row, right? Basically, if I take this row and multiply it by this column, what quantity am I going to get? If I take two negative one zero and multiply it by this quantity, this column, what am I going to get? How do we do determinants? What was one way we did it? We did row reduction or Yeah, we did the cofactor expansions, right? How did we get the coefficients for these? It was those entries, right? So when I take row one times column one, I'm going to get the determinant of A. 
When I take row two times column two, I'm going to get determinant of A. When I take row three times column three, I'm going to get determinant of A every single time. The more interesting thing that happens is that what happens when you do the other ones that aren't on the diagonal? Let's just do one. If I took 2, negative 1, 0, and multiply it by negative 2, 4, 0, what do I get? If I take row 1 times column 2 there, what do I get? I get 0. What happens if I take row 1 times column 3, what do I get? I, I get 0 again, yeah. Every other entry is going to be 0. So we end up with, when you take, this is a big property for our adjoints. When I take a matrix times its adjoint, you get a diagonal matrix with a determinant of A down its diagonal. No matter what the matrix is. The, re the reason why you get zeros everywhere else, when you're doing those other products, you're doing a determinant of a matrix that has identical rows. That's what happens when you're doing a real different combination. If you're doing a determinant of a matrix that has identical rows, you want a determinant for zero. The way it comes about that. Not, I'm not showing that, but that's what happens in this particular case. But it's a really cool property of the adjoint, even if it's computationally expensive. It's a cool property of the adjoint that this happens. So you uh, a matrix times its adjoint, you get a diagonal matrix that determines it down the diagonal. It also gives us another way to calculate inverses. What do I know this value is? If A is invertible? Zero. If it, if it is invertible, it's not. Not zero, right? So if it's not zero, then I can divide by it, right? So in particular, if A is invertible, then the inverse of A is 1 over to the determinant times the adjoint. It's computationally expensive, but one, one benefit, I suppose, if you hate fractions, is that if you have a matrix with uh, integers in it to start with, you can deal with only integers until the very, very end. And then do the fraction at the very, very end. Here. So if you really, really hate dealing with fractions, you can just not deal, deal with it when you're doing the inverse until the very, very end. But this is how you calculate an adjoint. Like I said, it's not exceptionally, I mean, it is tedious, right? The property at the end that we get is interesting. And we get a diagonal matrix that has determinant of A down the diagonal, which is kind of fun. And again, this property is true for any matrix. doesn't matter if it's invertible or not. In particular, if the matrix is not invertible, what's this product going to end up being? If A is not invertible, what is the it times its adjoint going to end up being? The zero matrix, yeah, because I'm determined it will be zero. Okay. All right. Let me show you real quick that you can, your uh, calculator does not give you the adjoint, unfortunately. Well, at least the TI-84s do not. However, R does. So let me show you on R real quick here, in case you want to check an answer. Okay. There are other obvious, there's other uh, programs that will give you adjoint. You do have to, load, remember we talked about installing a package to help us do different things, right? Uh, for, for example, when we did the rever, uh, reduced row echelon form. It's a different package to install. I can spell the word packages, that would be helpful. R Conix is the package that you need for the adjoint. Again, if you install the package, you only have to do it the first time to install it. I should install without any issues. Boom. Okay. 
And then once it's installed, it's always installed, but you do have to call the library just like we did before, right? Remember that? I know it's been a little while since we played with R. Ooh, hey, that is not what I wanted. And again, these packages that we are you uh, calling in here, obviously load other packages or load other functions as well. But what we want is the add joint. So let's define a matrix. I'll call it A. Let's do the matrix that we just did which I don't remember what it was. Two negative one, does someone want to read it to me? Two negative one zero. Say it again. Five one one. Three negative four, negative two. And then remember we have to tell it how many rows there are. And then uh, I better say by a row. I know, like I said, it's been a little while since we've got used R. So uh, when we type in a matrix, one of the ways we can do it is if there's a big long list, we use C in front of it to tell it we have a big long list, tell it how many rows there are, and then tell it I put it in my row. There are other ways to do it as well, which we will use here coming up in the next chapter. Oops. No, we'll do it this way. I'm not storing it here, but the command for adjoint is just adjoint of A. Is that what we got? Cool. Good. That's what we got. Wonderful. The reason why I wanted to show this on here is just so that if you're doing these problems, you can check your answers. Right? Your calculator. At least the 84 and won't do adjoint. Now, if you're clever and know how to program on your 84s, you can probably get it to do it. Programming on the 84s is kind of a pain. I did that when I was doing, I did that for a linear algebra class so I was doing something else when, uh, during the pandemic since I had time. It was not pleasant. <laughs> At least from my perspective, it was not pleasant. It's, um, one of the things that's difficult to deal with is the lack of variable names, because you can only use single letters, at least from what I can tell. So anyway, uh, just to verify that we really do get a matrix with the determinant, we get a diagonal matrix with the determinant down the diagonal. Let's take A times its adjoint. Remember to do uh, multiplication, matrix multiplication, I have to put percent signs around the multiplication symbol. Otherwise, it'll just do term wise, entry wise multiplication, which is not what we want. <laughs> okay, so notice it's got some uh, rounding issues with however it's doing the adjoint. But what number do you see down the diagonal? I see negative 9 down the diagonal. And essentially everything else is 0, right? This is 10 times negative, 10 times, or excuse me, this is 10 to the negative 15. This is 10 to the negative 16. All right, so those really are 0. So I really do see something with a matrix, uh, down, or excuse me, negative 9 down the diagonal. And we should be able to check the determinant. Oops. Spell. And then do determinant of A. Oops. And then I hit a capital A. There we go. We really do get negative nine. So again, this was just a quick check to make sure that we were doing our computations correctly. Like I said before, my goal right now for R is just for a, a giant calculator for us and just exposing you to a different program. We're not going to be doing any of the programming capabilities or the statistical capabilities of R. It's just a matter of doing, um, trying to use some of the matrix functions that we have so that we can uh, use it as a tool that might be a little bit more, a uh, little bit quicker to do things than doing it on your calculator. Is the process of finding the adjoint okay? I mean, it's not a very interesting process in and of itself. 
The property at the end is interesting. At least I think it's interesting. And then uh, think you can reproduce what we have on R on here? You want to go take your answer? Yeah. All right. Uh, we will do one more application that's related. Uh, well, actually, it'll look like two applications, but they're really related to each other on Wednesday. Uh, it'll help you do your web assign assignment for 3.4, which will be due on Sunday, so you're not having two due in one day. And it's basically just another calculation way to say, hey, are these three points collinear? Uh, co or are these four points coplanar using determinants? So we'll talk about that next time. And uh, then we'll also get started in chapter four. But I didn't want to take two minutes to try to get ahead of things or try to get started on something. So have a good one. We'll see you on Wednesday.